Kama kamiti na nasema Hello and welcome. I'm Trisha Edwards, Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm so glad to have you all with us today. We're pleased to welcome you to our program. We are all connected, saving species and preventing pandemics at the ways in which the health of humans, animals, and the environment are inextricably linked. I know it's going to be an interesting and certainly timely discussion as we all continue to grapple, grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, we have just a few housekeeping items. This program is being recorded. The link will be posted on the Smithsonian Affiliations YouTube page in the coming days, and we'll also send a link out to everyone who's registered today. If you have comments, please use the chat box, which I see so many of you are already doing, which is wonderful. Um, be sure you're sending your messages to all panelists and attendees. That, ma that makes sure that everyone can see um, your notes. If you have questions for our presenters, you can put them either in the chat or in the Q&A box, and we'll be monitoring both those locations. And please note that while on-topic discussion is encouraged, we ask that you express yourself in a civil manner and treat others with respect. The Smithsonian monitors and may remove participants from the program in accordance with its terms of use, and a link to those terms is in the chat for your reference. Closed captioning is available. Just click the closed caption button on your screen and the captions will appear. If you have a technical issue or a question unrelated to today's discussion, please use the raise your hand feature or, or type it in the chat box and a Smithsonian staff member will assist you. And finally, there will be a short survey at the end of the program as you close out of Zoom. And we hope you'll take just a moment to complete it to help us better understand your needs and interests and help us inform future programs. Smithsonian Affiliations is pleased to host today's program in collaboration with the Smithsonian's Global Health Program and to have both Veronica Galicia and Dr. Maureen Kamau as our featured speakers. At Smithsonian Affiliations, we partner with museums and cultural organizations across the country to support their needs and those of their communities, people like all of you joining us today, while also furthering the Smithsonian's mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Like the Smithsonian, our affiliate partners are committed to education and public service and work in collaboration with the Smithsonian to catalyze critical conversations in their communities and help us all better understand the world around us. This work seems more important now than ever before, as we, like all of you, grapple with so many big issues, including the effects of a global pandemic. Today's program is a great example of the ways in which the Smithsonian and our affiliates work together to bring thought-provoking and relevant content to audiences like you. With the help of 22 affiliate organizations, we are able to serve many more people than we could in a single in-person program and we we're able to start a conversation, not with one community, but across many, from Florida to Iowa, North Carolina to California, and Ohio to Oregon. Now I'm delighted to turn the program over to Veronica Galicia, Program Specialist with the Smithsonian's Global Health Program. In her role, Veronica assists the health program's mission-critical programs, including facilitating multiple overseas projects. She assists with all aspects of research projects, including design and procurement, sample collection and processing. Additionally, she supports field veterinarians while home and abroad. Veronica is also active in grant writing and manuscript submissions. And prior to joining the global health team, she was a zoo and wildlife veterinary technician at Smithsonian's National Zoo. With international work experience in Africa, Latin America and Asia. Her international experience includes work with the Chinese government assisting radio collaring of Kowalski's horses for reintroduction back into the wild and research on primate cardiac disease and drills at the Limbe Wild Life Center in Cameroon. Veronica? Hi everyone, Can, um, I'm Veronica, um, as you guys have already heard, uh, I am working for the uh, Global Health Department. I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, 
where we are branched out of, which is the uh, Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Next slide, please. Uh, it is a 3,200-acre 3, uh, facility located in Front Royal, Virginia, that houses between third, uh, 30 to 40 endangered species. It's a research facility that includes a GIS lab, an endocrine lab, a gamete lab, a veterinary clinic, radio tracking lab, and 14 field stations and a biodiversity monitoring plots. Um, at the facility, scientists work on extensive programs in reproductive sciences and conservation biology. Um, research perta pertains to conservation of endangered species and ecosystems locally, nationally, and around the world. Um, the primary goals of SEBI uh, in research are to save wildlife, save habitat, and restore species in the wild. So it's very fitting for us to be a part of SEBI. Um, the Global Health Program um, is a multi, multi, multidisciplinary approach uh, to wildlife medicine and conservation. We work uh, to combat threats to conservation, um, study emerging infectious diseases, and safeguard public health globally. We collaborate with uh, different veterinarians, epidemiologists, ecologists, public health specialists, and conservationists. Um, our mission is to strive to maintain the survival of endangered species by identifying and addressing health concerns at the human livestock wildlife interface um, because the health of people is inextricably linked to the health of animals and the environment. Um, this one health approach uh, identified by, is identified by a collaborative multi, multidisciplinary effort um, and uh, which helps with different collaborations. And the Global Health Program um, focuses on wildlife health in relation to conservation and public health risks. Next slide, please. And so look, with the Global Health Program, we have uh, three main missions. Um, our first one is rapid response to clinical medicine. This one health concept recognizes that critical uh, connection between uh, global human health and the health of domestic animals uh, and wildlife and in the environment. Uh, with some support of the Global Health Project and our Kenyan partners, we have developed numerous uh, One Health research programs. Um, and zero surveillance of disease carrying insects uh, and other vectors. And we've also collaborated in different rabies research and community uh, vaccination campaigns in Kenya as well. And these pictures you can see we've, uh, uh, with our different collaborators and our different veterinarians that have uh, traveled, uh, we've helped the wildlife in different assessments and exams. Next slide, please. And through research, which is very important to us, we've been able to collaborate in disease investigation and emergency responses, being proactive in health research, uh, helping in conservation medicine, we're helping with the One Health, One Health Initiative with um, emerging infection disease research uh, and uh, human health projects and then also capacity building because that's very important to us as well. Um, and then we've also been a, a consortium member of USAID's Emerging Pandemic Threats Predict Projects, which is the surveillance of wildlife, cam uh, wildlife and camels and people. Which... Next slide, please. Um, and also, so the last main uh, kind of goal for the Global Health Program um, is training and capacity building. So we have different internship and fellowship pro uh, programs, both nationally and internationally. Um, and we have uh, veterinarians uh, that come from abroad, that come here and collaborate with the different Smithsonian scientists because we have a lot of knowledge to share or vice versa. Um, so it's a very uh, nice collaboration and then also uh, veterinary capacity building workshops. We recently did a rhino training workshop where different uh, scientists and specialists from the National Zoo went to Kenya 
and did a workshop to collaborate with Kenyan veterinarians and other specialists there and just kind of uh, talked about what the differences in what they did together, which was great to work together. Um, also lectures and presentations, and then also uh, the One Health Disease and Surveillance, um, and also uh, one at the government level as well in helping that. So with that said, uh, I am here to introduce Dr. Maureen Kamau, which is a very important person to our team. Um, she is a veterinary research fellow uh, in the One Health program at the Global Health Program, um, which is based out of Lycipnia, Kenya. Um, this uh, program, it helps to increase the uh, regional wildlife veterinary capacity in conducting research and to collaborate to outreach and with outreach and training. Um, it's a partnership with the Kenyan Wildlife Service, uh, Impala Research Center, and Old Yogi Wildlife Conservancy. Um, Maureen's love for animals guided her choice to pursue her bachelor's degree in veterinary medicine at the University of Nairobi, um, which is known for a strong One Health program, uh, which fr from which she graduated in 2016. And then she underwent a one-year internship at the Kenya Wildlife Service, where she gained extensive extended field um, wildlife veterinary experience. Um, there, during this time, um, uh, disease ecology at the human wildlife interface piqued her interest and um, the one health approach to improve the wildlife medicine and, and and the one health approach to improve wildlife medicine and domestic animals. Maureen hopes to contribute to wildlife uh, conservation and help um, sustenance farmers and policymakers to make a better informed decisions and evidence-based scientific findings. We currently have 696 individuals in the entire country with 62 of those found at Oljogi, which is Kenya's second largest rhino sanctuary. I am Maureen Wanjiko Kamau. I'm a wildlife veterinarian from Kenya. We recently began a rhino endocrine study. Research has been identified as a critical need to help them with their reproduction. We are using a non-invasive technique. We are training the rangers at Oljogi to collect the fecal samples from the black rhinos. They play a critical role in monitoring the individuals. Collection of stool gives you a snapshot of the individual's hormone status at that time. And with that, we'll come up with endocrine profiles that inform us on the reproductive status so that we can have many rhino babies to increase the eastern black rhino population. Wild animals especially are nature's gift to us. Our efforts to conserve the animals and their ecosystem is our gift back to nature. Um, so, thank you, Veronica, for such a great introduction. Um, in case anyone missed it, my name is Maureen Kamau, and I'm a wildlife veterinarian and researcher based at Mpala Research Center in Kenya. I am currently pursuing a veterinary research fellowship with the Smithsonian's Global Health Program. And prior to this, I was a veterinary intern with the Kenya Wildlife Service following my graduation from the University of Nairobi in 2016 with a bachelor's in veterinary medicine. In the next few minutes, I'll be sharing a little bit of background information on, wh on where I live and work in Kenya and the work I've been doing as a veterinary fellow with the Smithsonian's Global Health Program. Next slide. Uh, so the Global Health Program is based upon the One Health platform, which recognizes that the health of humans and animals, both domestic and wild, are linked to one another and to the environments they share. And our work focuses on addressing health challenges at their source, which is the human wildlife interface. In my role as a Smithsonian Field Veterinary 
fellow. I conduct and support wildlife clinical interventions for sick and injured wildlife species with the Kenya Wildlife Service. I also undertake research into wildlife conservation and emerging infectious diseases at the human wildlife interface and provide training for upcoming conservation medicine professionals. Um, so this slide depicts previous emerging infectious disease outbreaks and areas at high or low risk. From past experience and the current pandemic, we are aware that ecosystem change driven by increase in human populations, coupled with land use change in areas with diverse wildlife are the main drivers of disease emergence, which emphasizes the need to look at diseases at their source, um, the human wildlife interface. The Global Health Program focuses its training and capacity building at these interfaces to understand emerging infectious diseases and contribute to wildlife conservation. <clears throat> um, so Kenya hosts one of the most diverse mammal herds in the world, and our wildlife policy follows the theory of conservation through protection, where the conservation and management of wildlife is administered through a system of national parks and reserves which occupy 11% of Kenya's landmass. Interestingly, 65% of our wildlife occurs outside of these wildlife reserved areas, and there is a shift in the wildlife policy to better involve communities in wildlife, um, wildlife conservation. Um, Laikipia County, which is where I'm based, is very unique and serves as a flagship for the coexistence of people and wildlife, sustaining 80% of the endangered gravy zebra population, about 50% of Kenya's rhino population, and globally important African wild dog parks. The main land uses in Laikipia are livestock keeping and wildlife tourism. The prevailing situation in Kenya is no different from the rest of the world. Our human population increase is driving the demand for animal-derived proteins, which in turn is leading to the expansion of our livestock production system in the form of increased stocking density in wildlife conservation areas. Interactions between humans, livestock, and wildlife are therefore expected uh, to, to increase and to continue to increase which may create opportunities for disease spillover. A highlight of my fellowship has been a chance to be involved in One Health initiatives, such as the Lycapia Rabies Vaccination Campaign, hosted at Mpala Research Center annually. Rabies is a global zoonotic disease causing an estimate, an estimate of 59,000 human deaths each year, particularly in Asia and Africa. In Kenya, 2,000 human deaths are attributed to rabies annually, and disease is one of the major threats to African wild dog conservation. The Lycapia rabies vaccination campaign was established to protect the human population and the, Afri and the endangered African wild dogs from rabies through vaccination of domestic dogs, which are the primary reserve for rabies in Africa. The vaccination campaign and community engagements to share findings from research provide the opportunity to interact more closely with the communities and address risky behavior that may predispose to disease. I am also involved in disease surveillance in cases of unknown disease outbreaks in wildlife, collection of vectors such as ticks and mosquitoes from the environment, and opportunistic sampling in wildlife during immobilizations. All this is to help us understand and hopefully predict uh, future sp uh, disease spillover events. With declining wildlife populations, the survival of every individual is critical, making wildlife clinical interventions crucial to provide critical care to wildlife with human-induced or naturally-induced injuries that, if left untreated, could be life-threatening. Here are photos of um, wildlife cases that I was intimately involved with. Um, the picture to your left is a zebra fall that was abandoned and I was involved in its rescue to a wildlife rehabilitation center for hand raising. 
and um, the elephant to your right has been immobilized for treatment. Um, it had a pebble on its foot and the weight from the pebble inflicted a lot of pain causing severe lameness which could predispose the elephant to poaching. And after removal of the pebble, the elephant walked away feeling relieved and happy, I hope. Um, so fractures are common occurrences in free-ranging wildlife and surgical repair is rarely attempted due to challenges in rehabilitation of wild animals, impaired function which can hamper rewilding and relatively high cost of treatment. Pictured here is a four-year-old cheetah which had a fracture on its forelimb and three six-week-old calves. <laughs> They're so cute. Um, so when threatened wildlife species are involved, such as this cheetah with young calves, we had to attempt surgical repair. Next slide, please. Um, so the surgical procedure was performed by a multidisciplinary team consisting of wildlife veterinarians, a small animal veterinarian, a physician anesthetist, and physician orthopedic surgeon. And the purpose of this was to give this cheetah the best surgical outcome. This again highlights the multidisciplinary efforts under the One Health Initiative that can contribute to wildlife conservation. Um, so this procedure pro provided a medium for knowledge and skills exchange between wildlife veterinarians and human physicians, and the opportunity to use advanced technologies in human medicine that are not yet fully adapted in field wildlife medicine in Kenya. So the cheetah is now fully ambulatory, living with her three cubs with plans in the future to rewild all four cheetahs. Another focus of my role is research. Uh, yeah, sorry. Have, okay, so another focus of my Fellowship role is research, and I'm very excited about the Eastern Black Rhino Reproductive Study at Oljogi Wildlife Conservancy. And just to give you a bit of background, Kenya is a stronghold of the, of the Eastern Black Rhino subspecies, with 77% of the world's in situ population. The Eastern Black Rhino population is still critically endangered and intensively managed in rhino sanctuaries. We now recognize that failure of a rhino to reproduce and contribute to overall black rhino population is similar to, if not worse than, the loss of a rhino as a result of poaching. Some rhinos have been reported to be performing suboptimally with intercalving intervals longer than three years. This results in a reduction of rhino calves born per year, reduced lifetime, um, reduced lifetime reproductive success and failure to attain optimal population growth rates. The aim of this study is to characterize the ovarian cyclicity of female black rhinos at all Jockey Wildlife Conservancy to determine whether intrinsic factors such as irregular ovarian cyclicity and or pregnancy losses may be contributing to suboptimal reproductive performance. Um, so due to the intractable nature of wild animals, we, we are working with female black rhinos fecal samples. Um, yeah, so we seem to, okay. Yeah, we seem to have lost my slides, but yeah, I'll, I'll just keep speaking as we try and figure it out. Um, so there are many reasons that I am excited about the rhino reproductive ongoing at all jockey. And one of them has been the opportunity to work with the rhino monitoring rangers and management at all jockey who are passionate about Eastern black rhino conservation and work so hard to monitor and ensure the safety of the rhinos, which has then enabled research. Um, I'm very thankful to the rhino monitoring rangers who have assisted in the collection of over 1000 rhino dung samples for the rhino reproductive study. 
Um, so the Rhino Reproductive Study is a first in Kenya to serially monitor estracyclicity in rhinos over time. Through collaboration with the Smithsonian's Endocrine Laboratory, the Global Health Program set up Kenya's first field wildlife endocrine lab. This lab will provide wildlife veterinarians and conservation managers with access to a resource that will enable data sharing at near real time. Redu reducing the time taken between sample collection and decision making while also serving as an educational laboratory that supports researchers and students from around the world studying the physiology of Kenya's wildlife. The head of the Smithsonian Endocrine Lab flew out to Kenya to provide training on hormone techniques and such capacity building will maximize impacts of the new resource, the Field Wildlife Endocrine Lab, and ensure continuity in the use of the lab. The data obtained from optimally performing Eastern Black Rhinos will provide a baseline for free-ranging Eastern Black Rhino estracyclicity, which can inform on individuals fit as founders or translocated for reproductive purposes. This can further augment collaborations between the various sanctuaries in Kenya to strengthen unviable or underperforming populations and contribute to rhino population growth. I, um, the hormone analysis data can also be assessed in tandem with other environmental variables to determine how free ranging wildlife are responding to changes in the environment. A good example of this is an accepted manuscript written by Sandy Odor and Janine Brown on stress physiology in African elephants. I hope that this study and Sandy's study will demonstrate the broad applicability of hormone analysis and other biomarkers of health for more wide widespread use for the conservation management of free ranging wildlife in Kenya and the region. Um, so as Veronica mentioned, one of the uh, pillars of the global health program is training and capacity building, which is really at the heart of the global health program. And I received guidance and training from my mentors at the Smithsonian's global health program and Kenya Wildlife Service veterinarians. I was paired with Dr. Ellie Mills, who is an American accredited wildlife veterinarian for my fellowship, and I got to learn a lot from her as well. I also participated in an advanced rhino medicine course organized by the Smithsonian's Global Health Program in collaboration with Mpala, Oljogi, and Kenya Wildlife Service, which brought together various professionals from the Smithsonian, South Africa, and Kenya involved in rhino medicine, husbandry, and conservation. When you receive, you give, and I am happy for the opportunity to also provide training for upcoming conservation <clears throat> medicine professionals in Kenya and uh, abroad. So over the past few slides that you did not fully get to see, I'm sorry, I have shared a global perspective on threats to wildlife populations and of emerging infectious diseases. Use some Kenya specific examples to highlight both my and my global health program colleagues efforts to address and prevent, prevent emerging infectious diseases and save species globally. Key points to leave with you are that we, human, humans, animals, and our shared environments are all connected and interdependent across broadly diverse geographies and cultures. A one health approach to collaboration and cooperation across institutions, disciplines, countries, and continents is critical to ensure healthy populations of wildlife and humans thrive well into the future. I would like to thank and acknowledge our partners, Mpala Research Center, Oljoki Wildlife Conservancy, the Kenya Wildlife Service for their support on the fellowship position. Our funders, Dennis and Connie Keller, um, the National Geographic Society, which funded the Rhino Reproductive Study and Maurice Animal Foundation for providing funding for training. Thank you all for taking the time with us today. Thank you, Maureen, and um, thanks everybody for your patience as we, um, you know, had technical issues as many times as we test and we're on Zoom. There, you know, sometimes things happen beyond our control, but 
I'm wondering, Maureen, would you want to go back and just review the slides that we missed? Um, or do you want to just move forward from here? Mm. Move forward. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody, for your patience. So please, um, we have a couple questions coming in, but please um, either post in the chat or in the Q&A um, things that are on your mind. Um, so a couple of questions that have come in so far, Maureen. Um, one, Karen White asks, how do you handle the natural movement of wildlife beyond the borders of a refuge? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, so most uh, national parks and reserves in Kenya have wildlife corridors. So those are um, like sections left open on around the fences that allow interconnectivity between um, contiguous um, wildlife conservation areas. So yeah, movement is allowed. And Katie asks, how is money raised for surgical care of wildlife in Kenya? Hmm. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a challenge. Um, uh, wildlife surgical procedures are, of course, very expensive and um, expertise is also quite expensive. So wildlife um, surgical procedures are quite expensive. And um, I think most funding for such procedures, well, for example, for the cheetah that I just showed you, it was all pro bono. We are really very thankful for the human physicians, you know, for, for their acceptance to um, um, operate on the cheetah at no cost. Um, they didn't even charge for the equipment. So we don't quite have, um, we don't quite have a means to raise funds for that. Yeah, I hope, I hope that kind of answers her question. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think, first of all, I thought that was one of the most fascinating parts of your talk, all of which was so interesting. But the idea of a multidisciplinary team and the idea of people with lots of different backgrounds, even, you know, doctors who don't normally work on animals coming together and share expertise and skills. And I think, I know we have a lot of students joining us today, um, which is wonderful. And I think that's a great um, lesson in that, you know, as you're thinking about your schooling and moving forward, I think we often think we have to, you know, we're specializing in one thing, but when we get out into the workforce and we're working, it is so collaborative and everyone's bringing different skills and expertise to solve a problem. And I think your presentation really, um, really highlighted that in a great way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, you know, interestingly, as you, as like as I began my career, I, I really I really did not think it will end up where it did. Um, um, but the one thing that I carry with me is, um, you know, passion and purpose for what you do. Um, and of course, um, an open mind to collaborate really will help solve the you know, prevailing issues that we have in our world of today. Yeah, I think that's a great message because as, as we're learning now, but also as you demonstrated in your presentation, I mean, things come up that we've never solved before. And so we have to think of new and innovative ways to approach them. And it's really hard to do that on your own. So it's the, the idea of collaboration is so important. Um, and very related, Miriam's asking a question um, she said, you have such passion for your subject. And since we have so many students on the call, could you comment on how you knew you wanted to be a vet? And I'll add on to that. Can you talk a little bit about your career path? And Veronica, I would be really interested to hear from you as well, you know, how, kind of what was your path through school, how you knew you wanted to do what you do and how you got there. So Maureen, if you could start and then we'll, we'll move over to Veronica, that would be wonderful. Um, so I've, I've always loved animals ever since I was a little girl. Um, I remember I didn't have dolls, but I, ha I always had puppies. We had this dog that gave birth every so often. So puppies have been my, <laughs> have been my little dolls go growing up. And um, since then, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to my parents and my family for their, you know, for their keen eye to, you know, notice my passions and to um, guide me in the right direction. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I ended up doing um, my bachelor's in veterinary medicine. And um, when I got the opportunity to intern with the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is very rare, I was super excited and you know, I wanted to learn everything I could. <laughs> yeah, so I'll say, yeah, that's, that's how I think I am here today. Thanks. I'm sure you're not the first person to be inspired um, to go into veterinary medicine by puppies. I think they're, they're pretty irresistible. <laughs> so Veronica, how about you? Kind of the same. Uh, my family's from Mexico. So when I was younger, we used to go to Mexico when I was little and uh, my the from a little country town. So I used to always visit the animals versus the family members. And so my love from animals grew from there. And then um, in uh, college, in high school, I found out about, uh, I was going to be a vet because that's all I knew that people that worked with animals were vets. Mm -hmm. um, and so my animal science teacher asked me, what about a veterinary technician? And I'm like, what's that? They're like a nurse for animals. And I'm like, that exists. Um, so I looked into that and, and I learned that the veterinary technician did more of the hands-on work than the book work. And school wasn't really my thing, but I liked the hands-on stuff better. Um, so I decided to go more that route. Um, and locally here in Virginia, there's a two-year community college. Great. Didn't have to go to that much school uh, and got to be a veterinary technician. Um, I I grew up in the D.C. area, uh, going to the National Zoo in preschool. Uh, my dream was to go to the National, to, to work at the National Zoo. Uh, and when I was before tech school, I was volunteering at the zoo. In tech school, I, I got the opportunity to volunteer at the vet hospital. And right when I graduated tech school, one of the technicians was leaving. So I got the opportunity to work as a veterinary technician at the hospital at that point. Um, so I got very lucky. And so if anybody is ever wondering how to get into zoo uh, work period, I, I always say volunteering is the way to go because it, it's hard to get in positions like that when you don't have any experience. And most of the time they want experience and the best experience, if anything, is volunteering. Um, and then just through that, I, I worked at the, as a veterinary technician for 11 years and, and now I have the great opportunity to be a part in a different uh, aspect with the global health department. Wonderful. Um, I know that early on in the chat, um, we had posted some links about internships um, at the Conservation Biology Institute and other opportunities, um, which are wonderful. But we have a, a question that's a little more general. Um, what is the best way that students can get involved with conservation programs? I mean, volunteering sounds like a great Thing. Are there other programs or other avenues that you guys would recommend, either specific or general? Uh, specific to zoo medicine or just, I think, specific to anything? I think just it was generally about conservation or animal work, I think. Yeah, uh, I mean, volunteering, looking for different programs, looking at local conservation projects that are going on. Unfortunately, a lot of those don't pay. A lot of those are volunteer uh, opportunities. Yeah, uh, you know, whatever it piques your interest, start Googling and basically go from there. I would recommend that. Great, thank you. Um, and Elizabeth has just posted the um, in the chat again, internship opportunities at the zoo, which includes yeah. the Conservation Biology Institute. And I think, you know, if, if you're not in the DC area, um, I think just looking at what's around locally, local yeah. zoos, local conservation organizations are a great place to start. Um, and they can often be a great resource of sending you, if they don't have the opportunity of helping you find one that yeah. is there or looking at a local university um, at a conservation program um, and seeing what resources might be there. So Yeah, just reaching out, like for me, being a veterinary technician and knowing Spanish, I looked at abroad, what, what opportunities there were out there. There was a bear conservation projects going out in Ecuador. I'm a veteran te technician, I speak Spanish. Can I help you? Can I go? So I volunteered there in Ecuador for a week. Um, so just think outside the box basically is what I would recommend. That's a great if you're one. interested, again, it doesn't pay, but it, <laughs> it gives you self gratification. And from there, it's, it, you can put it on your resume and that is experience. That's great. Um, we've got a couple of questions specifically about um, rhinos and your work with the black rhino. 
Um, so Cheryl says, uh, Maureen, thank you so much for your work in saving wildlife, actually to both of you. Um, so how long is the gestation of the black rhino and how many births in black rhinos have you experienced in the past year? Wow. <laughs> so the gestation period of um, the black rhinos is 15 months. Um, I have not yet been privileged to um, watch a rhino give birth. Um, in fact, eastern black rhinos are very shy and prefer um, bushy areas. So when they're about to give birth, you can barely spot them. They hide for days until um, at some point they come out to the cute little baby rhino. So yeah, I hope to see a rhino bath soon enough, someday, yeah. But thanks, Nicole, for sharing that uh, photo. Um, so um, let's see, we have a question from Judy who wants to know if you have, um, if you know how many rhinos are endangered or what is the population right now of the black rhinos? Um, so, the black, black rhinos in Africa are, um, they're about 5,000. 5, um, so the, we, have, we have several subspecies, um, but the Eastern black rhino subspecies is native to um, Eastern Africa. And Kenya hosts, um, you know, the, the world's most um, in situ population. Yeah. Um, great. So Fani wants to know, we've talked a little bit about collaboration in the work that you've done and um, the question about, um, have there been opportunities for you to collaborate and share your findings with the, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Imire, I-M-I-R-E, Rhino and Wildlife Conservation in Zimbabwe, or are you sharing your findings with other scientists elsewhere? Um, so the study is still ongoing. Um, it's, it's just about concluded, but as soon as it's concluded, we hope to share findings, of course, with the wildlife conservation, rhino conservation managers in Kenya, um, the Kenya Wildlife Service, which um, manages the wildlife resources in Kenya and, of course, um, across the region. So glad to share our findings in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and there's, we have a couple questions about poaching. Um, so about how does poaching affect um, the number of rhinos you have in your study and what is being done to, to combat poaching? Um, so poaching is still a major threat to wildlife um, conservation in general, especially, especially in rhinos. Um, and a lot of um, conservation money goes into ensuring the security of rhinos. Um, but in the situation in Kenya is quite unique um, because there are a lot of uh, security measures in place, monitoring, um, monitoring measures. So poaching in Kenya is actually below, has been below 1% for a couple of years now, which is really great because, you know, with proper, with good security and proper monitoring, then we as researchers can do research. You know, it's, it's easier for us to go in and um, do research. So, yeah. Great. Um, I guess sort of related to that, um, we have a question from Judy about, um, is the Kenyan government supportive toward conservation? Do they support those security measures or are you, or, or, or do those sort of happen outside of the government? Um, so they happen both ways. Um, so rhinos are managed in privately owned um, rhino sanctuaries and government owned rhino sanctuaries. And um, the government also commissions its um, wildlife monitoring rangers to assist the private sanctuaries in um, rhino security and rhino monitoring. Um, and we actually have a question about the southern white rhinos, which I'm not sure if that you'll be able to answer. So feel free to say you don't know, um, since I know that you work on the eastern black rhinos, but we have a question about how successful the introduction of the southern white rhino has been in Kenya. Um, so I think the introduction of the southern white rhinos has been um, successful. I think the southern white rhinos are thriving and performing well. Um, yeah, but I'm not in a position to provide um, additional information. Great, thank you. 
Um, and a kind of a fun question for Miriam, I think, what has been the most interesting thing you have learned about rhinos? Um, hmm. The most interesting thing. I'm trying to think. Or maybe your favorite thing or the coolest thing. Um, I think the coolest thing is, you know, the rhino is portrayed as a very um, somewhat vicious, vicious animal. Um, but in real sense, when you get to interact with, say, the captive population, they're actually very gentle giants. Yeah, so I, I find that very interesting. And they, they make the, <laughs> the cutest little sound. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's the coolest thing I think about rhinos. Um, what what are the most common illnesses that you encounter in rhinos? Um, so the most common illnesses we encounter in rhinos in Kenya are um, so they tend to get a rhino skin disease, um, which occurs on their shoulders. Um, with, um, yeah, so that's, that's the most common disease as of now. Um, other than that, yeah, not much. Okay. Um, and one more rhino question, um, and then we've got actually a couple, I think, for Veronica. Um, can you talk at all about how climate change is impacting or is expected to impact rhino populations? Hmm. So it's it's thought that rhinos drive at um, in environments that we human beings cannot survive in. Um, so in in that sense, rhinos are very resilient, and um, you know will probably, of course, be affected by climate change, but will hopefully still continue to exist in um, areas that you know, areas that we human beings may not be in a position to survive in. Thank you. Um, now, Veronica, we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, what are some of the endangered species that, SAB, that SABI has at its facility? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, gosh, several. Uh, Black-footed ferrets, which they were a big part in reintrodu reintroducing them back into the wild. Kowalski's horses, Maine wolves, clouded leopards, um, several different types of cranes that I can't think of the names right now, um, different types of birds, unfortunately, that I can't think of the name. Kiwi, I know, for, I know because I love kiwi. Um, Eld's deer, cheetah, just a, a, a good variety of different species. And Donna asks, um, can you share more information about the Perwalski's horse, either what you did with them or what you know about them? Okay, yeah, the, it was it was it was great to be a part of that project in that we did in uh, northern China, because they had a select herd that they were wanting to get out into this open space. Well, they had them kind of corralled in a smaller space, but they had a lot of. Um, nomads in the area that had the domestic horses and so that what they wanted to avoid was interaction with the wild with the domestic horses and the controlled uh, Perwalski's horses that they had that they wanted to introduce so what we were doing basically is since they are still wild horses they're not tame at all um, we want we were um, darting them anesthetizing them in their herd um, and putting radio collars on them. So we were collaborating with the, um, the different researchers that were working on um, tracking them with that. So we were just the veterinary depart part of that, monitoring the animal and doing the anesthesia of the animal for that. Um, and then making sure that the animal recovered fast because they do uh, work in a herd type situation. So if they are in any way weak, the herd will definitely take advantage of that. Um, and so, uh, we would uh, uh, put them under anesthesia, put the radio call on, collars on them. They would get all the do uh, data that they wanted as far as the measurements and all that other stuff of the body and, and thing, whatever, blood samples and things like that. And then we would recover them and 
stay away from them and make sure that they recover well. It was interesting because it was a, a in the mountains, you know, in a, a, a wide range. So we would basically be in a vehicle and, and dart them with the with the dart gun and hope that they don't go far away and hope that they safely, wherever they decide to go to sleep, it's a safe area for us and them. So, um, and it was quite uh, interesting to be a part of that project. Great, thank you. And Elizabeth has um, posted a little, a little more information from the zoo's site about the horses. Um, let's see, I think we have just a couple of questions before we wrap up. This has been fantastic. I was saying when we were gathering before we invited our audience in that I was a little nervous because this was so outside of my own area of expertise, but I feel like I've learned um, just so much from your presentations and the questions that have been asked, so thank you. Um, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, um, Maureen, but I'm gonna throw it out there since it came in from Valerie. Um, is she is asking if there's any movement in Kenya to promote plant-based eating so that livestock production doesn't increase and natural habitat for wildlife is preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not informed of any plant-based um, organization in Kenya, um, yeah. That's fair enough. Um, I think and we have one more question, which I think is a, a fun one to end on from Katie, who asked, what is your favorite part about living in Kenya? Um, hmm. It's a lot. It's the people, the environment, the animals, of course. Um, yeah, I really love my country. Um, the people are really warm and great. And yeah, the biodiversity is very inspiring in this um, career. It seems like a great place for you to be doing the kind of work that you're doing. So, um, so thank you everyone. Thank you to Maureen and Veronica, especially for um, just helping us learn so much more about this important topic and sharing their work and their knowledge. And thank you so much, the audience. We had such great conversation in the chat um, and really great questions. And thank you to my colleagues who were great at responding with links and information. Um, as we mentioned, we'll make sure that everyone gets a link to the recording once we are able to upload it to YouTube. We'll also include the chat with all those great links um, when we send out the email to everyone who registered. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day and rest of the evening for you, Maureen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.